Welcome to the Happiness Initiative Leadership Training, Part 1. This is the nuts and bolts of conducting a happiness initiative in your community, in your town, in your city, in your campus, in your company, company or in your country. My name is Laura Musikansky. I am the Executive Director of the Happiness Alliance, and we've been doing this work since 2010, working all over the world. So you're going to get lots of tools and resources and knowledge based on lots and lots of experience. So we're going to go over today a little bit about team building, some awareness raising, and some data gathering. And in part two, we go over data analysis, uh, convening communities and decisions and budgeting. So let's just dive right in. The very first thing you need to think about when you're going to be doing your happiness initiative is to know your purpose. Now, you may have all three of these buckets for purpose, or you may just have one. It's going to depend upon your circumstances, and there's many different factors of your circumstances. I think of the three different buckets as awareness raising, policy, and publishing. So you may want to, what may drive you is to let people know about happiness for, the, for their personal happiness. You might want to let people know about the happiness movement. We talked about that in the who, what, when, where, how piece in the presentation. And maybe you're a coach and you want to integrate the happiness movement into the work that you're doing with as a therapist or as a coach. You may be a policymaker, or you may want to influence policy. You may want to bring happiness data into policy decisions. Um, that has been done in various governments, in various campuses, and even in classrooms. You may want to guide the policy promulgation. You may want to have policies being created to enhance people's and to support people's uh, pursuit of happiness. And you may be a researcher. So there are many different purposes, and you may have all three. Probably if you have a long-term project, a long-term happiness initiative, you are going to have all three of these in various different um, ways that they will show up. This very much, what your purpose is, very much is, is based on your circumstances. So if it's just one of you and you are blazing ahead in your community, then that's wonderful. And it's really important to be aware that while your purpose may be to have your policymakers to transform the basis of their policy from based on economic growth to based on happiness and well-being, your purpose may need to be a lot more focused on awareness raising. On the other hand, if you're the city manager, you can really focus on integrating these tools and resources into your government, but still you'll want to do some awareness raising and some, uh, some work on, on publishing and social media, as well as academic journals, the whole range. So think about what your purpose is. Now we'll jump, you'll jump forward. Um, before we jump forward, I'll say one more thing on purpose, which is that you can change your purpose, of course, as you're going. And as you change your purpose, you will change the rest of the pieces of your strategy. So the next thing that you want to do is to convene your team. Now, here's an idea of a dream team. This came from a city manager in when one of the cities that we worked with convened his dream team, and it included everything from the the, the, of course, there was the government as well as they had the media, they worked with the university, they had the Boys and Girls Club, they had the health authority, etc. So you want to convene your dream team. Um, think about what your dream team is and then convene your dream team as, as you can. I would say that some of the things that we've learned from dream teams is that you want to think strategically of who you're bringing into your dream team. You probably want to have somebody with media because that piece of raising awareness is so important. Do know your purpose and then as you bring in more people into your team, you will your purpose will change and it will morph and this is partly because the circumstances of your team will change. Um, think about what are the resources, what are the connections and, and also what is the commitment that team members are going to be giving. And most importantly is to be nice and to have fun. And if you have a team where you've brought somebody in 
um, or maybe even you yourself um, are, are not being nice, then it's time to stop and pause and reconfigure. Um, whether that's to reset yourself or you might need to reform your team. Because if you're not having fun, if it's it doesn't mean that all of the work has to be fun, but if overall this doesn't give you joy, then it's not going to work in the long run anyway. So now you have your team. You can start to develop your strategy. Now you have some idea of your resources and you can have some ways of how you're going to um, identify what makes what makes for success. So take some time to think about what your dream team is and then start convening those people. And if it's just you, that's okay too. As you work, you will attract people who want to come and work with you. So that's a little bit about team building. A few reflections from the past work that we've done is that keep open to new membership as more as you grow and as media talks about you, other organizations, other people will want to join you. Keep the long haul in mind. You will have, as with any large project, any kind of project that you're doing to change an entire system, you will have times where it feels impossible. You will have hurdles. Just keep the long haul in mind. It's, it's progress, not perfection. And then intentionally develop your team culture and be very aware, especially early days, of who is on your team and how are you walking the talk in terms of really treating each other with respect and being having a loving and positive environment and protect your team to with that positive environment. All right, so now we want to talk a little bit about awareness raising so because you are going to have a lot of people attracted to you, some of them in a negative way and some of them in a positive way. Sometimes the negative way that the reason that they're attracted to you is because they have a lot to say about happiness. And one of the things that I like to say is that we can use all kinds of words. We can use the term well-being, well happiness and well-being beyond GDP, beyond, beyond growth. Gross, gross domestic product or quality of life, sustainable development and well-being. But what we really mean at the end is the same thing, is that we're talking about living in a world where people really matter. We're really talking about living in a world where we have ecological health, where we have security, where we have sustainability. Lots of different ways to talk about it. And in some circumstances, happiness will not be the right word to, to use. We're seeing more and more people are using the term happiness and well-being. And some people are trying to say that these two terms have some different meanings, objective and subjective, or happiness is just the way people, about how people feel, and well-being is about all the other dimensions of happiness and well-being. It doesn't really matter. What's really important is that you're flexible in using the terminology as your project develops and as your team develops. Okay, a little bit of edit strategy. We can talk about this in terms of this is going to be your MBA in five minutes. So strategy has various components and various tools and resources for strategy. There's the vision or mission, vision slash mission. Sometimes people have both. What are your values? What are your long-term objectives? And then we want to develop SMART goals. We'll talk about what SMART goals are shortly. You could do, or you don't have to do these things, but you can do what's called a SWOT analysis and then develop your action plan. It is important to know what your vision is, what, what is the future that you dream of, and to be able to verbalize that so that when people ask you, you can answer that. It's. I feel that it's really important when you have a vision or a mission statement that you have it, something that you can remember and other people can remember and that really gives people inspiration. So the Happiness Alliance, our vision is a world where all beings thrive. So that's something that I can remember and probably you can too. Next we go to what your core values are. and. The way that we did it with the Happiness Alliance is that we did what we call a word cloud. So we just had our board members write down all of the things that are important to them and then put them in a word cloud and the, the ones, the biggest words are the ones that are our chief core values and then we have other core values as well. 
but it's really important to know your values. We spoke about that earlier in the other presentation of the who, what, when, where, how, how values and measurements are, um, are intricately, intricately entwined, and we know that the values are what really, really drive us to do what we do. So it's good to have a value statement. So then your mission is where your vision is, your long-term, what you envision the world, your mission is, why are you here? So our mission at the Happiness Alliance is to awaken happiness in all beings. So you can figure out what your mission is. Again, like with your vision, your mission should be something that draws people to you. So when they read your mission, they want to be part of your group. They get you and they want to be, they, they love that idea. Next, you want to develop what your long-term objectives are. What do you want to achieve in a year, in five years, in 20 years? And then from there, you can develop your SMART goals. So your SMART goals are goals that are specific, measurable, actionable, realistic, and time-bound. So perhaps if it's just one of you, maybe one of your SMART goals is to have two other people that you're working with by the end of the year. And so you you set that kind of a, that's a specific and measurable and actionable, realistic, time-bound goal. You don't necessarily maybe set your goal, maybe you, maybe it's realistic for you to have 20 people that you're working with or 20 different organizations. It really depends on your circumstances. Same thing with your data collection. Perhaps with the Happiness Index, you want to da gather data for 2,000 people, or for 20 people, or for 200 people, or for 20,000 people. You really want to be realistic on your SMART goals. Um, they need to be um, something that you can work towards, and then once you do achieve your goal, it feels really good, and you can set the next one. Um, a SWOT analysis isn't necessary, but it can help you to define who you are. And you can think lots of, there's no point in just uh, listing out your strengths, your opportunities, your weaknesses, and your threats without really thinking about it. Otherwise, it's just a sort of an exercise in futility. So go ahead and think about your strengths of what is it that you can build on. And think about your opportunities of what is it that you can take advantage of. And your weaknesses is how can you solve or adapt who you are for your weaknesses. And then your threats, you want to think about how, how to prepare for those so that you don't get taken out of the water if, um, if something like whatever it is that your threat is happens to happen. So almost to finish our MBA in five minutes. Your action plan. Now this is just the brass and tacks. So you're really thinking about, okay, this is this. If my goal is to have 20 more people on my dream team, or to have 2,000 people take my happiness index in my community, um, how am I going to do that? Who do I need to contact? What are the steps? Um, how am I going to get the resources or the funding to me to be able to make this happen? So that's your action plan. So that's a little bit about um, your about the, the brass and tacks of a strategy. And we have some different models for how you can conduct a happiness initiative at happycounts.org. You'll see that in the, the section about read up on the happiness uh, movement, you'll see this, this article, Happiness in Communities, which is also linked on this presentation. And it has some models. We've written this article so that it's very clear and step by step so that you can look at these models and then adapt them for your your project. So a little bit um, on, on the strategy is start small and design for success. So if it's just a small team, if it's you and a few other people, then start there. So just have start see if you can um, build just build up you can think of it as like Russian dolls just to, just start with the small and then just keep building up. So awareness raising is going to be very important for the, any kind of work that you do. And we have a whole other presentation on awareness raising, but we'll talk about that a little bit here. There are different models for awareness raising, everything from press releases and proclamations to social media, events, um, and then speaking events and panels, and then bringing in your press. The key point for awareness raising is be on message and message and be very clear on your message. 
And at the end, always ask for one thing so that people remember what is that one thing that you asked for. So your one ask may be take the happiness index, go to, and then you say your, your, your website, go to happycounts.org and take the happiness index. So the happiness movement is happening. The happiness movement is important. And then you can say what your mission is. The happiness movement is a paradigmatic change. We're changing our paradigm from based on money and profit and economic growth to based on happiness and well-being because that is the purpose of life. That is the purpose of government. What can you do? Take the happiness index. Go to happycounts.org. So keep your message clear. And some journalists, if you're interviewed, you'll find that they try to divert you. Bring it back to your key point and then end with your ask. You can gather lots of knowledge about the happiness movement with our who, what, where, why, how um, training as well as on the website at Happy Count, so you'll have lots to, sp to talk about. Another tool that we have is our happiness proclamation. You'll also see this in our happiness policy handbook, the happiness policy handbook, a book that um, I wrote with my colleagues Rhonda Phillips, the Dean of Purdue Honors School, um, Honors College, and a community researcher, as well as Jean Crowder, former member of Parliament of the Canadian government. So you'll have a happiness proclamation and a model press release there that you can um, you can use as a model for developing your own press release as well as here. And it's important when you do issue your press release um, and your, um, about your proclamation that you make yourself available. And there's more information about that and how to do that in the Happiness Policy Handbook. So now let's just talk a little bit about gathering data. I've already talked to you about the Happiness Index. That is um, a subjective measure of well-being, which we'll talk about later in this presentation, as well as more about in the next presentation, that you can have a direct experience of how we measure happiness right now by going to happycounts.org and taking the happiness index and then you can use in your community. Now this is important. This is a valid measure of well-being. What does that mean? It means that, that the questions that are asked in the happiness index actually capture the data that reflects people's happiness and well-being. And you can see our happiness index methodology that we have published with the Journal for um, Social Change. There's a link to it here in this presentation, or if you go to happycounts.org, you'll be able to download that for free. So let's talk a little bit about gathering data. Now we're going to get kind of technical here. There's two different modes of gathering data. One is convenient sampling and the other is random sampling. What is convenient sampling? Convenient sampling means that whoever takes that survey, they choose to take that survey. So the happiness index, um, if you go and you go to happycounts.org and take the happiness index, you're part of the convenience sampling. Random sampling is different. The people who take the survey are randomly sampled. Say it used to be that you would get the phone book, but now, of course, there are, I don't even know if there are phone books anymore. But it used to be a person would get a phone book and they would just highlight we're going to call this person, this person, this person, this person. And you can you call a certain amount of number of people based on the general population. And then you, um, well, I won't go into too much detail, but you call a certain amount of people and then you adjust for what the population actually is. And then you, what you do based on the, by, based on the numbers is you have um, the data that reflects the population. So there's some issues with random sampling in, in that who has a landline anymore, right? When we call people on cell phones, um, for me, I don't answer necessarily unless I know who that person is. Um, and if I don't, they have to leave a message. And most of us are shy to call anybody on a cell phone, even our friends, right? We text now. You can't do a survey <laughs> through text so much. So we use computers. There's a lot of random sampling that's starting to happen through the internet, um, and there's some that are door-to-door -door and some that are done um, over uh, the postal service. Um, so there, there's some issues right now with random sampling that most people don't want to talk about, but what we're finding more and more is that cities, as well as um, larger governments, 
are more open to relying on convenient sampling. Random sampling is quite expensive. You'll read more about it in the Happiness Policy Handbook. You can read about some of the formulas for um, identifying how many people you would need to get a representative sample because that's what you really want, a representative sample from um, a random sample or from a convenient size. That's called a sampling, um, a sampling size. Why do you want a representative sample? Because then you know you can rely on that data that it reflects the population. And that's very important for policymakers. So if your purpose is for policy purposes, then you're going to want to think about that sample size and representative data. I mentioned outreach um, in terms of random sampling, and we'll come back to this. When you've decided, say, that you want to gather 200 different people are going to take the happiness index in your community, there are going to be people that you can't reach because they, maybe you, you send this out on various media. So you have the newspaper talking about it, you have social media talking about it, and lots of people are taking your survey. But there are certain people that you can't reach. Um, you're going to probably need to do what we call paper ballots. So that's where you go ahead and you print off the happiness index and you go right up to the people. You have people going right up to the people and gathering the data with the paper, with the paper ballots. Again, it's really important that you start small and build gradually. Um, I mentioned earlier that we have a an article that gives some different procedures and different models and so go ahead and use that for thinking about how you're going to um, gather your data for your for your happiness um, initiative. When you use our happiness index or any other uh, any other subjective tool for gathering data people are going to have concerns about data trust and data security particularly in this day and so what we can say about the happiness index is that you're using a tool that is provided by the happiness alliance and so we have some language here for your project you can re you can um change the name of your project. This, this, this language here is for a project that we have called Planet Happiness that informs people about uh, our privacy and data security practices. All right, that's all of part one, and I hope that you enjoyed it. This is part of the Happiness Alliance's tools and resources. This video and these, um, present this presentation is copyright. If you would like to use it, please contact happycounts.org. You can contact info, I-N-F-O, at happycounts.org, or you can contact me, Laura, at happycounts.org. And I um, hope you enjoyed this presentation. Please do buy the Happiness Policy Handbook, and please donate to the Happiness Alliance. Thank you.